Today we are going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to be talking about those situations in which we are called to judge. We're talking about judging based on the purity of the church, judging based on who they are in relation to us, and judging based on the fact that it is better for the person who is judged. Today I tried to dress like my best judge, I don't know, the best I could do. But the idea is, have we ever thought about at the end of judgment, we come before God, who is the Almighty Judge. And we have two options at this point. We can come before Him, and people have not helped us out, and not been, hey, you need to fix this. Hey, and come before God, and then be all right, judged, completely condemned, there is no second chance. Or, would we prefer if we come before a brother, and a brother comes to us in love? And as we talked about, going to them one-on-one -on -one and then going before two or three witnesses and confronting them. This is a, a hard passage because in 1 Corinthians 5, you're dealing with the purity of the church, protecting that. But you're also dealing with the fact that if you don't do what is stated here, somebody's going to lose out. The, the risk here is that if 1 Corinthians 5 is not carried out, someone burns in hell. 1 Corinthians 5, we're going to throw the order around a little bit because I would like to end with that concept of why 1 Corinthians 5 is so important. But let's start. 1 Corinthians 5, starting in verse 6. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump. Just as you are, in fact, unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, also has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor the leaven of malice and wickedness, but the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. If you came in here today to take communion and I told you that one of these pieces of bread has been poisoned, how many of you would like to play Russian roulette? Um... But that's not the image you even get here. You get that if there is a piece of leaven in here, let's say one of these is leaven, that it no longer is Russian roulette. It's Russian roulette with a shotgun. Because what he says is that that one piece enters in, that tiny bit of leaven gets mixed into that bread and it all becomes leavened. You no longer have unleavened bread with a little bit of leaven in it. You have unleavened bread that has become leavened bread. And what happened was they weren't only having immorality in the church, they were excited about it. And that, that sounds like that'd be foreign. You know, why would you be excited about having wickedness in the church? So, so I went through YouTube because that's, you know, where I find a lot of my good answers. And there was this United Church of Christ commercial. And what it said was, we love everybody exactly as they are. And then it had this bouncer at the front. And what was happening was some were allowed to come in and some weren't. And the idea was they were so tolerant and so much better than everybody else. They were bragging about how sinful they were. They were bragging about the fact that they allow sin in there and you don't need to change. And what happened is you have a church that is so weakened by this that, yes, there was this little introduction, but everything had to become weakened. You could no longer preach about anything that would upset somebody. Jesus is the only way. Well, I mean, what if somebody gets upset? Isn't that saying that some people won't make it to heaven? And in this arrogance, what happened is this tiny bit of sin that we tolerate spread. Until we're no longer allowed to speak. We're, we're known as hypocrites, so when we do speak, it carries no weight. Well, well what about this situation? Is that different? Well, uh, yeah, it's different. That's a different type of sin. We, we can tolerate that. But he goes on, and this is not about us being judging our world. This is about us instead judging ourselves. Looking into our brother's and removing the leaven from us. The world is full of leaven. 
The world is full of malice and wickedness, and that's to be expected. It is not to be expected within the church. Starting in verse 9. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I did not at all mean with the immoral people of the world, or with the covetous, swindlers, or idolaters, for then you would have to go out of the world. But actually, I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he is an immoral person, covetous, idolater, or reveler, or a drunkard or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Do you not judge those who are within the church? But those who are outside, God judges. Remove the wicked man from among you. This is the complete opposite of modern Western Christianity, isn't it? We're always talking about those wicked, evil heathens. We're, we're looking at him and going, I can't believe those people who don't believe in God and have no reason to follow his word don't follow his word. Those people who have no hope anyway because outside of Christ you can be the best saint in the world. Who cares? It doesn't do you any good. Paul said it, if the resurrection is pointless, let us eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. He's saying, live it up. There is no reason for our world to be living a sinless life. And why are we so concerned the way they're living, and yet when something is in the church, we're unconcerned with it. We're unconcerned to the point that we know that these people within the church, the giant church, the one that Christ bought and the one that Christ knows who belongs, and so if one is called a brother, we don't want to straighten them out so that one day they can be with the Lord with us. So that when I have blinders on and I can't see my own sin, that I know my brother's going to say, hey, you need to fix this. And it no longer becomes, well, I'm doing as much as I can. I can't see anything wrong. I guess that's where I got to stop. It becomes my brother going, what about this? My, my brother taking something and saying, this is wrong. Let me show you where it says this is wrong. Now, I'm not saying we become personal judges and our preferences become attacks. But instead, the scripture is hold as God's word. And we then come to God's word and we say, God has told us that certain things, immorality, covetousness, idolatry, reveling, drunkenness, swindlers, not even to eat with such a one. And he tells us that we are to purge that leaven. And he also tells us that only that leaven which we are concerned about is our brother's. Starting in verse 1, let's see why all this comes to us. What the whole point of any of this is. And it's beautiful and it's loving. 1 Corinthians 5, starting in verse 1. It is actually reported that there is immorality among you. An immorality such as a kind as does not even exist among the Gentiles. That someone has his father's wife. You have become arrogant. And have not mourned instead, so that the one who had done this deed would be removed from your midst. For I on my part, though absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged him who has committed this sin, as though I were present. In the name of our Lord Jesus, when you are assembled, and I with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus, I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. So that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. 
It, it's what we were talking about when I started with. I said, would you rather have your brother come to you in love and say, hey, this needs to be fixed? Oh, you don't want to listen to me? Let's take two or three and talk to you. Now let's take the whole church and talk to you about this. And at that point, we're going to shut you out so that your spirit may be saved. So that you can have a hope of heaven. And this harsh passage has to be done in this spirit. If it's done any other way, it doesn't make sense. But if you are the one and you see sin, you see this division. The biggest one I always see is you have this divisive spirit and you'll have... A group, a person, a family. I don't know why it's always a family where I'm from. I guess because we're all intermarried. But you have this family, right? And you do. And you'll have, you know, whatever clan, they have that last name. There'll be five generations, right? And then you have this other clan, Hatfields and McCoys, is all I'm used to. And you have this divisive spirit that enters. And it starts out very small. And instead of dealing with the divisive spirit, when one person is starting division, they're being, they're reveling. We let it go on. Because we're like, well, I mean, you know, that's, that's natural. And what happens is it builds to you have these fights. It builds to you have these massive problems that can no longer be dealt with one-on-one. -on -one. And we don't force it. We don't say, y'all two are fighting, work it out. Our, our idea is, well, let's separate you two. And, you know, at the judgment day when God goes, why did you hate your brother? We say, uh, you know, it just happens. Why did you, you have unforgiveness in your heart? Oh, yeah, we, we just let that go out because, you know, you don't want to try to make them be friends. You don't want to try to bring them together and say, hey, you need to settle this. We need to see who's in the wrong. We need to purge ourselves from that wickedness before it grows. Sin is described as a cancer. And it's probably the best way to see sin is because leaven is, unless you're good at cooking, I don't know how many of us use leaven. We buy our bread pre-baked. But we know of cancer. Someone will get cancer and the idea is cut it out as quickly as possible. You know, if you have cancer in a small area and you can cut it out, and we're like, there's no more cancer. We celebrate. We cut out something from a person's body and we're celebrating. Because it didn't spread. Because it didn't go to something else. Because it didn't spread to the whole person. And instead of that one thing being taken care of, we now have to treat a whole body. And at that point, you can't. And you have this sin that has overcome everything I was talking with a minister the other day and he was saying they'd gone so far away from the Bible that there were people in their church wondering if they should still preach the resurrection he was very upset by it but that was the thing they had allowed sin to come in very small they had and it was about tolerance and love and it was never anybody's wrong Confront them, say, hey, I don't, I love you, brother. I don't want to see you burn in hell. I don't want to see you suffer. I want to see you go to heaven with me and be with God. And that's harsh. And not one of those happy things to talk about. But the thing is, there is no more hate than to see the problem and see the cancer and go, let me wait till it spreads. Then we'll treat it. Now, how mad at your doctor would you be if you went to the doctor and he finds cancer in you? He sees that sin, but that cancer in this case, and he sees that cancer and he goes, we'll wait till it's a bigger problem. I, I would be very mad at my doctor. I want my doctor to say, hey, we're going to chop off a piece of your life. Excellent. Am I going to live? Yes. Am I going to have hope of eternal life? Yes. Take that chunk, whatever you need to take out. And if we don't treat sin the same way, then what's he say? He says, turn them over to Satan for the destruction of their flesh so that their spirit may be saved. And be real. 
and don't allow what is holy to become unholy. Don't allow what God died for to become a mockery. Number one reason not to go to church, Christians. Don't allow that to be so. And the idea is that we always look out for the good of our brother. None of us would do it to our children. Our, we will tell our children the correct thing, even though we know they're going to be upset. They're probably going to call us names, and they might, you know, slam a door. But we'll still do it because we love our children. And when we look at each other as our brothers and sisters, do we love each other enough for them to be mad at us? Do I love you more than I loved being loved by you? Do I love you enough to tell you when you're wrong? Because this, this has gone to such an extreme in places where you're just like, I want to tell you the good news, but I don't want to upset you. I, I, I want to tell you that you, you need to repent of your sins and get right with the Lord. But you're not going to like me. But, but you're going to be angry with me. And the fact is, none of us like to be confronted, so you should expect that if we tell people they're wrong, they're not going to like it. And we are left with a choice of loving or being loved. We're left with a choice of, I'm going to be hard on you now, so that me judging you is the worst thing you have to face. I know I would much rather stand before any of you than Almighty God and have him go, let me tell you what you've done. Okay. You know, you'll, you'll at least be a little bit nicer than that, hopefully. Even if you're that mean, you're not as big as him, so it's okay. But how much better would it be if we realized that the only thing we're doing is loving? When we're judging each other, it is not this divisive spirit. And it's weird how in the middle of this, one of the sins it lists is reviling. Listed as division in other places. King James uses dividing. NIV uses dividing. And we look at it and we say, I love my brother more than I love being loved by my brother. More than I want that good feeling of, you know, tell you how great everything is. How about we be real and say, you know what? I see sin. What are you going to do about it? Don't you want to fix that now while you still have opportunity? Don't you want to confront that sin now while you have a chance to get right with the Lord? So that you come to the Lord and he says, well done, my good and faithful servant. Instead of depart from me, I don't know you. These are the two examples we're given on Judgment Day of God either saying, one, well done, my good and faithful servant, and the other option is terrible. It is, depart from me. I don't know who you are. What are you doing here? I never knew you. And if we are a church that is afraid to love, then all we do is become leavened bread. No longer the church. We become leavened bread. We become something God never intended because people aren't coming there and being saved. Because we're afraid of upsetting them. With this, we, we offer an invitation. Mark 16 Verse 15 and 16. And he said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. 
There is a final judgment day. There is a condemnation and a salvation day. There is a day where we stand before God and we must be open and honest about everything and all those things that we thought we were harboring, those secret sins we thought we were keeping from God, God goes, let me show you. Let me show you where you didn't choose me as Lord. You said, I'm going to keep my sin. And you said, well, you know, I have that sin and I do that. And it's not a slip. It's a choice. It's one of those where you didn't accidentally say the wrong thing. It's one of those where you chose that sin over God. And God is forced to give you one answer. You trampled underfoot the Son of God. Hebrews describes it as falling into the hands of God. And it says it's terrible. Coming to God either as this Father who loves you who you have given everything up to. And he says, come on in. Or this God who says, you will face me as judge. And at the end of that judgment, there will be two decide, two decisions. Heaven and hell. Today, if there is anybody who has never come to God, given themselves fully to God, been believing in him, confessing him as Lord, Repenting of your sins. Being buried with him so that you can live for him and one day you get to be before him and he can say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Or if there's anybody who has sin in their life that they need to get out of their life so that they can hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. Or if there's anybody who wants to submit to the eldership here, we ask you to come now as we stand and as we sing.